This is the video lecture on Prelude 6, entitled Making Music Modern. <clears throat> so this is an introduction to the 20th century and beyond, which is considered to be 1900 to present. And we divide it into two parts, early modernism, 1900 to 1945, and then but it's 1945 to present, but it's all the 20th century and beyond. And of course we use 1945 because that's roughly the end of World War II. And uh, even though the first half of the 20th century was uh, influenced greatly by technological advances, we know what happened after World War II to present, which has already been 90 years, 80 years. So it's amazing how much, 70 years, how time has uh, passed quickly and technology is uh, rapidly um, changing and affects society and uh, culture. Our timeline here. Albert Einstein, you know who he was, who he was, right? Theory of Relativity. Uh, 1913, Igor Stravinsky's Ballet, The Rite of Spring, shocks Paris. Uh, there were riots, and we will talk about that and listen to that piece of music. In 1914, First World War begins. Uh, it was, uh, all wars are pretty much senseless, but this was really senseless. And you it had hundreds of thousands of soldiers died, uh, millions perhaps, uh, and I will look at the actual numbers, but it just uh, this trench warfare and and uh, toxic gases were were used to. And anyway, it was not. It was it was pretty nasty. 1919, the 18th Amendment, prohibition passes. Uh, what was that? Well, you know, alcohol was un, was illegal for uh, until I don't know what 1932. So we're done like 12 or 13 years. And the odd thing about uh, it was illegal to make alcohol and it was illegal to sell alcohol, but it wasn't illegal to drink alcohol. And uh, it was uh, silliness. And of course, that didn't stop people from drinking alcohol because they made a law to stop drinking alcohol. And they finally realized it in 1932 and repealed that um, Amendment. So it's uh, you can see how we we have this capability of doing drastic swings in the United States that affect millions of people, and congressmen make decisions like this that are based on personal opinions and not the will of the people. That's just uh, frightening, is what it is. But here's a good amendment: 1920 and 19th. Amendment, women's suffrage passes. Finally, women could vote, not until 1920. Do you believe that? Uh, 1924, George Gershwin writes Rhapsody in Blue. I think we're going to sample that piece of music. George Gershwin, uh, American music, jazz, Jewish, and New York City all combined. And then the Great Depression, it says, begins 1929. It really didn't, well, okay, it, it started, I guess, in 1929, but 1932 is when it hit, hit bottom and lasted for 10 years and really didn't get pulled out of that until uh, World War II, 1939, 1940. Uh, 1933, Works Progress. And uh, what this is when the government, because there was no, unemployment compensation. There was no social security. There was people were left on their own uh, without jobs and 20% of the population were without work. And so the government tried a number of different things uh, to help out the economy. And one of them is they, this Works Progress Administration, WPA, uh, offers job to Harlem Renaissance writers and to artists. So they designated money to be paid to artists for their work. So basically, um, and other things like 
and where I'm from in Western Pennsylvania, there are many walls along streets and roads that are uh, these stones. And they were made by uh, workers that didn't have a job and worked for the WPA. And they did community type things like fixing up roads and, and just to have a job. And people were glad to have a job and, um, and felt better about themselves when you can call yourself successful. 1939, uh, Second World War begins. 1945, first nuclear weapon tested. And uh, I think there was four places where the nuclear bomb was dropped. Uh, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, uh, Bikini Island, and the fourth place, you know, Alamogordo. So 1945, collaboration between Aaron Copeland and Martha Graham results in ballet in a ballet called Appalachian Spring. And we will sample that, that music in that ballet. Okay, let's move on. So um, we kind of uh, haven't got to the Impressionist period uh, that you might say came before and influenced the modern period in the 20th century, but we will. So this is still on the unit of uh, a secular song. Yes. And so there was this conscious effort to um, make modern music. And again, modern is just a term relative to what came before and what is modern uh, yesterday is not modern today. Unfortunately, that's the way it works, right? So this, um, how do you make things modern in music? Well, you, you kind of forget about the past and you think about new things, right? And the new way of doing things, maybe completely different. Uh, trying to look at the same thing from a different viewpoint. So this rejection of 19th century models, the way they did it, was old, so we're going to do it new way. And then also you have a suspicion of mass culture. It's like if everybody likes it, it can't be good art. So that was another way if you want to be a, a modern uh, artist is, is um, <laughs> if everybody likes it, it's not, it's not, uh, not modern enough. So, but modernists grappled with vernacular traditions, right? Mean, meaning that we have these local styles of music that uh, modernists, in some cases, took advantage of that and put that in their music. Uh, we're going to look at quite a few paintings here about modern art. And... Uh, Henry Rousseau, you look at this and you'd say, wow, this is, must be, you know, made in the 70s or something. Well, the artist died in 1910. Found his subject matter in distinct, distant places, the sleeping gypsy from 1897. Would you believe that from 1897? And here... Uh, the, the powerful abstraction of African sculpture strongly influenced European art. So this attraction to uh, non-Western art and then having an influence on your art is a way to make modern art. So top, uh, girl running on a balcony. Oh, this is the this Italian futurism experiments how art can portray movement. The title Girl Running on a Balcony, 1912. And this one here, Picasso, Spanish painter, use of vibrant colors and bold overlapping shapes in mandolin and guitar from 1924 looks beyond cubism 
toward the surrealistic school. Many, many subdivisions of art styles in the 20th century, more than many more than other uh, periods. So there's no unifying factor, uh, but there are uh, a couple main schools of, of uh, thought that we'll look at. So early modernist art considered 1890 to 1940, two influential arts movements, Futurism and Dadaism. Futurism started in 1909. Uh, it's a bizarre attitude uh, about military and uh, culture. And, you know, they promoted things like burning all the books, and tearing down libraries. It's like, what? Again, this is how scary that how humanity can go in different directions of destruction of behavior that doesn't make any sense. But maybe it does to them. Dadaism is just a name that they made up from uh, Dada. They just like were having a meeting of, of these uh, war resistors and reaction to the horrors of war, you know, all this craziness in World War I uh, taking place. And in 1916, they, a group of artists met and somebody just had a dictionary and they just kind of opened the page and put their name, finger on a, on a word, and it was Dada. And they said, that's the name of our art movement, Dadaism. And uh, works of art of absolute absurdity and simplicity. Dada group merged later into surrealism. Well, you know how that goes. It's not just a complete merger it's uh, uh you can choose to go this way you can choose to go that way other styles cubism based on squares and cubes that that the artists took advantage of and picasso was in this period expressionism and uh impressionism two opposites in, in a sense uh And we'll look into that, how impressionism is the, the, how the light makes an impression on me. That's why I'm going to write the, make the painting. And we have music that's called impressionism also. And um, we'll, we'll look at that in another unit. Uh, but expressionism is uh, usually has to do with uh, some... Uh, Something that's not right in the painting, and um, stress and and uh, not pleasantness like impressionism is all pleasant. Anyway, we'll we'll come back to this. So new styles are referred to as avant-garde, and avant-garde is a French term. It's really a military phrase meaning the front lines. You know, your guard that's right on the front, and uh, so a lot of times music or Art in general is uh, when it's pretty um, going in a direction that hasn't been gone in before. It's called avant-garde. So what's avant-garde? It's distingu distinguished from high culture and mass market taste. Again, if everybody likes it, it can't be avant-garde. And uh, if the rich people like it and go to concert halls, well, it can't be avant-garde. So here is an example of Impressionism from 1873. And uh, Impressionism was not just in France. It was an art movement all over. And you can still find artists today that would be painting in this style. And you would say, well, that's an Impressionist painting. So it's not like it was... The impressionist style was there and it was gone it's still in our society and uh many americans italians english uh were impressionist painters but it did start in france and it's always with these gentle pastel colors and everything always uh is nice it seems now this is expression called the scream from 1893 and everything is not nice anymore. And he actually made about, I don't know, a number of these paintings that are the same basic um, painting, but they're, but they're all slightly different. 
and some of them have uh, sold in the last few years. At least one did for, you know, millions of dollars. Pablo Picasso, Cubism, 1909. Uh, get the idea about the cubes. Surrealism, 1910, The Dream, Henry Rousseau, a French painter. Surrealism is like it, things that kind of don't make sense. Uh, like, well, here we go. She's this lady's on a on a reclining chair on a sofa, and these plants uh, and fruit. What is this over here? You know, I didn't notice it before. Oh, it's a human being. You can barely see it, but it has a musical instrument like a clarinet. Ah, never noticed that before. Uh, this is an example of Dadaism, and I think we'll um, look at more Dadaistic art later. But um, Marcel Duchamp was uh, a main artist in this uh, Dadaist and movement. And he called these um, ready-mades. He would take things uh, like a, you know, a rake or something and hang it by a string from the ceiling and, and give it a title, uh, you know, in advance of a backache or something and, or a snow shovel. I think he had one like that. And, and that's just, that was his art. Just, and, and, and it was like, it, because it was a reaction and, and, and disgust of what the bankers and the wealthy people were making money from World War I and millions of people were dying. It just didn't make, you know, and, and for, for what reason? It was nothing good. I mean, there was, nobody won. Italian Futurism, 1910, with these airplanes. Futurism again, with this Italian. Futurism, Italian Futurism. Here's the Bala, that same painting we saw earlier. Not the same painting, but the same artist. Oil on unvarnished millboard. In the Guggenheim collection. Guggenheim is a museum in New York. Have you been there? Uh, another futurism painting. Kandinsky was a Russian and he was also a musician. A lot of his uh, pieces have names uh, about music like this one's Composition 8. And uh, it's very distinctive style when you see it, you can immediately just say, well, oh, that's obviously made by Kandinsky. Uh, sometimes Google will put uh, art up on their page. And um, a while ago, they put up a Kandinsky. And it's like right away, it's like this is Kandinsky's work. Here we go. Total number of military and civilian casualties in World War I were about 40 million. And, of course, when the casualties uh you know, these people might live and still and be a casualty, but the medical treatment was not like it is today. And uh, many, many people were blinded and lost limbs and had to come back and try and be assimilated back into society. Uh, just very atrocious war. Musical markets in the United States. Here we talked about the menstrual shows, right? And now it says menstrual shows gave way to vaudeville. And we're not talking a great deal about that, but we might at some point. Uh, but, but again, this is big time entertainment. And in the late 1890s, recorded music started to be made available. And, um, you know, the sad thing about the recording industry is the number of people that worked as musicians it's probably never been as high it was just before they started recording music. And it just put people out of work because you could listen to music that had been recorded and not listen 
to music that was live. So there at one, you know, there was before the recording industry, a lot more live music and people made a living as musicians, which you can't do anymore. And this is uh, something that people don't realize. New York City, prolific center of music publishing. And uh, at different times, I don't know how it works now, but at different times, there were locations in New York City that a number of musicians would work and in that location. For one, in Tin Pan Alley, says a street in Manhattan, uh, there were many shops. And at the time, if you wanted to buy sheet music, because this was the way to buy music that you could take home with you because you didn't have recorded music or you would buy sheet music and you might go into a, a place where they sold sheet music and they would have five or six pianos there with salesmen that would be offering you walk in and say can i help you what kind of music would you like to buy and then you would say well it's you know i want to buy something that that my uh wife can sing to us on sunday or, or some other reason and you say oh fine Try this one. They would play the piano and sing the song. Do you like this? No. I said, Do you like this one here? And so that's how they would sell music. And people would buy music and sample it by having somebody actually play it and sing it for them. And then they would buy the music and, or not. And so uh, in many shops in the same area and the play, pianos were played all the time. And uh, they, they were worn out and they had a bad sound and they, there was a news reporter that went to write a story and he went into one of the shops and apparently uh, the owner of the shop said, let's go outside and talk because it sounds like a bunch of tin pans in here. With the, he was referring to the piano. And so the writer published his story and he called it Tin Pan Alley. And so from that point on, this area had was known as Tin Pan Alley. Uh, Irving Berlin, most successful Tin Pan Alley composer, probably by the amount of money he would make by selling music. And uh, incidentally, in the in the sixties and in the nineteen sixties, fifties, and sixties, there were buildings. Uh, one called the Brill Building, where a good portion of it were little studios that were sold to com about composers. And they would work and go to work at nine o'clock in the morning and have a, a partner. One partner would, one person would write the words and one person would write the music and they would write songs. They say, okay, it's 12 o'clock, time for lunch. All right, fine. We come back, let's work more on this song or make another song. And then they would try and sell those songs and come up with good songs. And so lots of times people think that, you know, music is written because of inspiration. And 90% of the time, music is written because of a deadline. And I need to sell this and make some money. And they were not going to pay me until I submit the song. It's about money. And then they would target particular artists and say Dolly Parton I think she would like this song but let's write a song for Dolly Parton and they would they would do that and then sell it to to you know an artist like that I think that still goes on I'm sure it does uh, so there was a lot of popular music and um, so records are starting to be sold and, and technology takes advantage of uh, the uh, music industry takes advantage of technology and to make money and they would make recordings of anything they could sell. And, and lots of times they would go into um, neighborhoods that were all immigrants and they would, you know, let's say be talking some foreign language and that was the main, you know, they were foreigners and they would go in and say, who is your artist that does the songs? And so they would, then hire them and they would make a recording. Then they would go back and sell it to the same neighborhood songs that are uh, in Italian or, or, or a music that was, was Polish music or, or any way that they, there was a lot of neighborhood and, and this was a market. So they say, okay, we can, we can make a recording and we can sell copies. 
But again, they they had to record each song individually until nineteen twenties. Another painting, nineteen twenty eight Spanish artist. Between two wars, music and the Great Depression. So we had that Great Depression, 1932 to 1940, and it certainly did uh, have an effect on uh, culture. And we talked about this Harlem Renaissance. Remember, there's a section in Manhattan that's called Harlem till, still to this day. And uh, for a long time, it was mainly African-American community and people would you know, be born there and live and and die and never leave the community, I swear. Uh, but they had a lot of jazz there and jazz ballrooms and white folks would come in and go to these ballrooms. And let us it's illegal to sell alcohol, but they had speakeasies and, and a lot of alcohol available. And um, in the old movies, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, entertainment to watch uh, the culture at that time with, with the you know, it's funny because they made these speakeasies in these bars that were hidden. And before Prohibition, women didn't go into bars. But during Prohibition, they made these illegal bars. And women went into these illegal bars for some reason. And it was common for them to attend. So after uh, Prohibition was peeled, repealed, it was the standard practice for men to go bars and the bars, but why? Why not? And uh, we'll we'll talk about jazz, how it how it changed and uh, was really really popular in the United States. A lot of patriotic songs. Uh, before World War One, there was this big Woodrow Wilson the, was the president, right? And he campaigned and said, "We're not going to go to war. We're not going to go to war because war was." It was clear that there was going to be a war in in Europe and, and perhaps it already had started. And they said, we're not going to go to war, we're not going to go to war. And then uh, he became president on that campaign promise. And then shortly after he became president, they, they uh, the German submarines sunk the Lusitania a ship, a passenger ship. And the Germans said, do not go in this area because we're going to sink every ship that's in this area. And it went in that area and they were sunk. Anyway, so now suddenly let's go to war. And um, there was a big movement and promotion. So you had popular artists like Nora Bays is suddenly singing songs about why we should go to war. And over here, over there, uh, 1917, and actually promoting the, the war, the war effort. Here is that song over there, sung by Nora Bays and her husband, Jack Norworth, 1917. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me. Everyone for liberty, hurry right away, no delays out today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine, to be proud of our boys in line. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there that the Yanks are coming. I don't know if we'll listen to this piece or not from 1915. Uh, and we'll listen to ragtime music in another unit. And how it became very popular and, and kind of morphed into a popular jazz. <laughs> The 
that sneaky, freaky, creepy melody. It just takes me, makes me reckless as can be. It goes to my heart, my head, my... James Reese uh, was an African-American band leader. And he was in the, in the uh, a soldier in World War One, and had uh, was a musician before and after. So we'll see if we listen to this piece, Jada. <laughs> Paul White Man. It's funny that he had that name, White Man, and he, there was, you know, segregation at this time between blacks and whites, and uh, you can make a case, a strong case, that that um, that African Americans originated jazz, and uh, it was real popular by to listen to and dance to by white people. And, but a lot of these hotels or dance halls, it was illegal for blacks to enter, but they would play music on the, on the stage. And so Paul Whiteman had a jazz band, popular, real popular band and uh, more popular than, than jazz. And he created a certain style of uh, not some, not improvisation, but, a, a more like a dancing and listening to music. Here is an example if we hear it, 1920 Whispering by Paul Whiteman's band. And these are these were national hits. I mean they sold thousands and thousands of copies of music. <laughs> This painting captures the energy of the of the of the jazz age, and that's what it's called. A certain period of time when jazz was real popular, and and uh, with the short dresses and short hair for women, which was really uh, a big change, and a lot of uh, parents didn't like it. This is a. a poem by Kurt Schmitters uh, from 1926 and he traveled around Europe performing these poems and there this is an actual recording that was made and I, and I have it and uh, where he would he would recite these poems that were just really letters in the German alphabet that he would make these sounds and there was didn't make any sense but it's a, it's a, it was part of that Dadaist art movement where things don't make any sense. And he was making art out of uh, the alphabet, basically. The music features of early musical modernism, non-symmetrical patterns, right? It, again, it kind of doesn't make sense. Changing meter quickly. It's like one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. Just a lot of um, things that are unpredictable. Polyrhythms, what does that mean? You have more than one rhythm going on at the time. And it's difficult to, to perform when you have, uh, you know, one and three, one and two, and different different combinations. Polyrhythms is what it says. Uh, paying attention to non-Western music again. And using popular music in your art music, using ragtime and jazz music in your art music. 
Kate Smith, 1938, uh, radio broadcast of God Bless America, certain strong nationalist sentiments at home. So the, the radio really the first broadcast of it was in 1920, KDKA in Pittsburgh, and it was a broadcast of some election results, I believe. And so this is a, like the birth of a new industry, and they're trying to figure out how they can make money with this. And most of radio was live broadcast. People would come up and be comedians, and of course, nobody could see them. They would oftentimes, most of the time, have an audience, a live audience, and then uh, entertainment for the live audience, which would be broadcast via radio, right? And then you had radio networks, so it could be broadcast across many states or all of the states, these different broadcast systems put together. So it grew uh, like that. And again, the microphone wasn't even invented until 19... 19- 20 something so you, I don't think you can have radio without a microphone I don't, I don't, I don't know. the new melody and harmony so uh, again 20th century music uh, uh, melodies don't again don't make sense they don't move logically they jump all over the place it's difficult to sing it's not for you and me to to uh, to listen to, uh, or to sing, for that matter. And maybe we'll, like, we'd be entertained by listening to it, but it was certainly, you know, consisted of wide leaps, dissonant intervals, um, unbalanced phrases, a lot of dissonance, right? Dissonance is tension, uh, where in prior style periods, tension is, is, is uh, um, released, and to a... To a um, You know, a, a tonic or, or just a, a, a tension and, and release of the tension. I'm trying to think of the right word, sorry. Consonants and dissonance. Poly harmonies, more, more than one harmony at the same time, using different scales. And then we came up with the idea of atonality around the same time, 1912. Uh, Schenberg as a concept of no tone no tonal center and there are 12 tones right if you count all the keys on the piano from one to the same thing there are 12 and the 13th is the same one and so he had um these rules for serialism as far as composing and one of the rules is you start with a melody if you want to call it that but he called it a tone row and it has 12 tones and you have to use all 12 tones before you can repeat any of the 12 tones so rules like that uh were were more important than trying to make a piece of music that was just what you expect it's like the result was unpredictable to a large extent Okay, anyway, the, the, I'm going to, in the next slide, mention the three most important pieces of music for the 20th century. And in our text, they put WC, which we haven't listened to yet, and his uh, Impressionist music in the Romantic period. And uh, most texts put Impressionism in the 20th century, even though it starts in the 1880s uh, but nevertheless it's considered the roots of the 20th century prelude to the afternoon of the fallen we will listen to that these three pieces and one it's it's odd because this one is about um rhythm this one is about atonality, and this one is about color or timbre, right? WC is the prelude of the afternoon to the afternoon of the fawn. And this fawn is one of those half goats, half man type creatures. So 1892, that's the date, impression. 
It's all about the color or timbre, abandon the melody. The French, uh, it's French. That's what it is. It's focused on very smooth with no bumps, like the language, right? Parlez-vous français, right? rendez-vous, all these nice rounded sounds is French language. And Schenberg, a German, so the WC and Impressionism is French. Schenberg is German and it's this German culture in 1912 and Expressionism, that's what we saw that painting of the screen. It's all about the atonality where they abandoned tonality and it's German, focus on extreme order, concise, like the language, Achtung. That's the, the German language has a more sharp sounding. And Stravinsky, the Russian, uh, wrote The Rite of Spring, 1913, which is an example of prim primitivism. It's all about the rhythm and where he abandoned the regularity of rhythm and the focus on irregularity, like the language. I can't speak any Russian, but if you hear it, it it's very irregular and um, not like the, the French language or the German language. So there is always a connection between the language and the resulting cultural um that's the culture culture that's created in, in art so we have these three impressionism expressionism and primitivism those three are big like the roots of the 20th century 1892 1912 1913 french german russian but he wrote it in 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 France, actually, uh, the Rite of Spring. So, and it's a ballet. This is a song cycle, and the prelude to an afternoon of a fawn is a programmatic piece, one movement. So this is about color, this one's about uh, atonality, and this one's about rhythm. The three above pieces introduce radical style changes from what came before, and the above three compositions changed everything. The possibilities were endless. So really, you need to pay attention to these three pieces of music. Another piece of art. Orchestration, the word orchestration. How did it change? We, we kind of overlooked that word, maybe, but orchestration is... Uh, the decision-making process of deciding what instruments will perform the music that you have written or that somebody else wrote. So sometimes somebody may just have a piano piece and another person will take it and make an orchestra piece out of that. Mazorsky's composition called Pictures in an Exhibition is an example of that. It was written for piano by Mazorsky, a Russian, but a Frenchman orchestrated it, decided what notes and how it would be formed by orchestra, and that's how it's remembered, not as a piano composition, but as an orchestra composition. So the composer did not orchestrate that piece of music. It's like I could have the flutes and a clarinet to this, or how about if I have a flute with a trumpet that's muted? You you take advantage of the of the timbres to be creative and 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 make entertainment. So, uh, but in the 20th century, the orchestra sometimes became smaller, and they used just small groups, uh, and not necessarily all of the orchestra, and a more attention on the on the woodwinds and how the colors and timbre that that they are available, they have available to play more rhythm and percussion instruments. The piano, piano is often used in the 20th century in orchestra. So there, these irregular lines are kind of the way you would could think about some of the 20th century music. Intersecting lines and bold blocks of color. So you have like two schools, those who are interested in preserving the tradition and maybe changing a little bit. 
and those who are whacked out and avant-garde uh, and want to to um, do absurd things with music. That is the end of our short introduction to the 20th century via Prelude 6.